Hello and welcome to Programming Like It's 1979, Nan to Tetris. Today is the final episode of the hardware portion of our course, and I wanted to thank all of you who have stuck with it through thick and thin. If you've reached this point in the class, you are a trooper. Today we're going to be finishing up our CPU, and we are then going to put that CPU in the computer. And when we are done, we will have a fully functional computer that can run machine code. After that, we'll be moving on to writing the software components necessary for the computer. Some of you have asked, is this part of some online course that I'm teaching? This is just my hobby. I'm going through this course because I took it and I really enjoyed it and I wanted to share it with people on YouTube. If you want to show your appreciation for the people who developed the course, I do want to remind you that their URL is nand2tetris.org. That's the numeral two. And they actually teach this course in two parts on Coursera. Part one is all hardware, chapters one through six of the book, The Elements of Computing Systems. And part two is the software projects, chapters seven through 12. This YouTube series would not exist without their book, without their course materials. I think it's amazing that they put those course materials online for free. I do encourage anyone and everyone who's interested in this stuff, buy their book, take the course if you are so inclined, and thank them for really sharing this work with the world. I think it is extremely valuable. I am not sponsored by Nissan and Shocken or by Coursera or anything like that. This is just my own love of the material and my love of the framework that they created for learning and understanding how computers work at a very deep level. With that said, let's get underway. All right, continuing on with our CPU. There is actually a mistake here which is right here. This decides what was, what is going to be routed to the A register. And the decision being made here is, do we take the, in, the instruction, the A input, the value being loaded, or do we just recycle the value coming out of the ALU? Um, and I have this, using the dest a flag, but that's actually already covered by the load a. So we're going to change this and we're gonna change it to C type, which is actually what's going to tell us whether we do this. And the decision being made here is, is this an A instruction or a C instruction? This correction was given to us by alert viewer, Ivan Toshkov. Thank you, Ivan. I really appreciate the correction. Unfortunately, much of this video was recorded before you pointed that out. It completely escaped my notice. Um, the HDL, it is corrected in the HDL because working from my notes, I managed to get it correctly. Uh, but you will see it with the incorrect value throughout this video. I do apologize for that. So First, we've already handled most of the input cases, I believe. Actually, this is one of the drawbacks to using tunnels, is that it's harder to tell when you've actually wired everything up. But I'm pretty sure we've handled most of the input cases. Let's think about these output cases. So we have this pair of outputs, out M, which is the conduit leading to memory indexed by the A register, and write M, which decides whether or not that memory is actually going to get written. So for out M, the implication of write M existing is you can think of it as being like a selector for an invisible mux that we don't have to deal with. And what that implies or suggests is that we can always send the output of the ALU to out M. And if it's not supposed to be written, that's totally fine because we're going to um, use the write M flag to indicate whether it should be written. So let's go ahead and wire that up right there like that. 
that takes care of our out M. And right M, of course, we actually have a flag that tells us whether or not we're going to be uh, sending that data to um, to memory, which is the cdest m flag. Nice and close, and that should, there we go, look at that. Just gotta get used to doing that. One thing I really like about digital is in fact, this, uh, the fact that it, it really gives a very vector feel, a very SGV, S, SVG feel. No matter how far you zoom in, everything looks nice and smooth, which I appreciate. All right. So we still have this address M field. I believe that is going to simply be the value in the A register. Uh, we'll come back to that. Let's think about jumping next since we talked about that. So we want to jump whenever one of these flags is true and whenever whatever condition these flags are talking about is true. And what does jump mean? Well, jump means we're going to put a new value into the program counter here. And that new value is going to be whatever is in the A register. And in the case where we're not jumping, we want the program counter to simply increment, right? So if we're loading a value into the program counter, if we recall the program counter spec, if we're loading a value into, in fact, we can just, let's go look at the program counter since I went to the trouble of making it. If we're loading a value into the program counter, then the increment doesn't matter. The program counter will increment, but then the value will be immediately replaced by what we are loading in. So the implication of that is that this increment flag is a constant. We always want it to be one. So let's go ahead and get a constant value, put it right there. All right. Now this load is going to be conditional and then the in value, what are we going to load? That's always going to be the same also. That's going to be this A register value. Because if you th remember our assembly language video, the pattern for jumping is you put a value in the A register, then you do some command and you jump conditionally. So let's go ahead and put that there. And then the last thing here is, is if we load, and I don't think we know yet when we're gonna load, but we can do our trick of putting a name on when we load. I don't want that to be the clock. Let's say, just call it jump. All right, so now we have a program counter. And in fact, this is self-contained enough that I'm comfortable getting rid of this tunnel, moving this entire assembly over here. Because really, in terms of layout, this is, this is kind of how that's going to work. All right. So now we really need our jump logic. We're getting close. So we do have these flags coming out of the ALU. One flag is ZR, which says that the value is zero. And one flag is NG, which says that the value is negative. And we have three jump conditions, jump less than zero, jump equal to zero, or jump greater than zero. So, Two of those conditions, I think, literally are exactly those flags. And the third condition we need to synthesize. So we could do this two ways. I think the easiest, we could do this with a mux, but I think the easiest way to do this is actually with end gates because we've got this jump 
binary value here that we want to we want it to be a one or a zero. So I, I think rather than thinking of this in terms of routing, we're going to move. Uh, we're going to make some logic here. So and is going to be this flag. Yep. This flag here. And I think we want some new tunnels as well. So we've got our. I'm uncertain. I should really experiment to find out. I'm uncertain. Can I name this the same as the output? I probably can. But for whatever reason, I like giving them slightly different names. So we'll call that negative. We'll call this one zero. We'll call it zero P. The three lispers out there watching this video just felt warm in their hearts. All right, so if these two are true, then that's one jump condition, right? We'll just put that there for now. We're going to make another and. And this one is going to be our zero condition, and that's going to be if we jump when equal. As a kid, I remember being very confused by the opcode JEQ in 6502 assembler because it wasn't clear to me that like jump when equal specifically meant equal to zero. I mean, I'd read it and I'd understand it, but then the instant those words were away from my eyes, I would forget that that what it means. That that's what it means. All right, so now we also need greater than. So logically, something is greater than zero if it is not zero and not negative, right? Okay, so we can we can make our own virtual flag here. Let's do it that way. And that way, all this stuff is still nearby. Right there, right? So, oops, I've already made a mistake. I said not, didn't I? Put that one, I need that much space. And that one. So that will go there. And this will go there. So there, we finally do have a little bit of wiring, huh? I know I've kind of avoided putting a lot of wiring nearby. There we go. Okay, and then we will give this its own tunnel as well. And that tunnel is going to be greater than. In fact, we'll even call it greater than P. No, no, we'll call it pause P. And just to be really clear about it, let's go ahead and do that. The one time I wanted this to say yes, I actually didn't uh, didn't bother doing it. Okay, we're going to put an and here. We're going to take pause P, put it there. And then we're going to take jump greater than and put it there. All right, so now we have three conditions under which we're going to jump. And we could put multiple OR gates, or we could use an eight way OR. Uh, I'm just going to simplify this in terms of the drawing and tell digital that this is a three gate or and uh, that'll work fine i feel like that's a simplification that is reasonable to put on a schematic 
Okay, and then lastly, we could send it into this jump gate, this jump tunnel. But again, why not? Since it's, since this is all so local, this is a case where I will go ahead and just move the thing near to where we want it, and we'll just draw a wire. Okay. So what do we have left? We have address M, and then we're going to have to fix any bugs that we have in here. And then we're going to write some HDL. So if I recall correctly, let's look at the code as always. The address M and PC outputs are clocked. So those are, well, we don't have to actually draw the clock. Address in data memory of M. Address of next instruction. So th this is not conditional on anything. This is just what's the address in data memory, and we know that that is the A register. Um, one thing here, though, is that this is only a 15-bit address, not a 16-bit address. So we do need to do just a little bit of adjustment here. So we're going to take a tunnel. We'll put it right here, right? And that is going to be this value here coming out of the A register. And then we need a splitter because we want to split out. Input is coming in as 16. Output is coming in as 1, 15. And we're going to throw away the 1. And that is backwards. So I did that wrong. I think it's backwards. Yes, there's the 15th bit, there's the 14th bit, zero, that's zero through 14, that goes there. And we actually have to do now something exactly the same for the PC, the program counter, because the output of the program counter, I believe, is a 16-bit output. Once again, let's go take a look at that circuit. Yeah, that's a 16-bit chip. Oops. All right, let's go and select this whole assemblage here. Yeep. Thank goodness for undo. Give ourselves a little more room. You know what? If we do this, we can make it exactly the same sort of Nah, we don't want to do that. We just want the same type of splitter. And I'll put it in the same horizontal position, hopefully. Well, regardless of if I've made mistakes, which I won't know until we write the HDL and simulate it, this is our CPU. What happens if I start the simulation? This should find any disconnected circuits. Oh, one bit needed, but 16 bits found. Did I make this a one bit mux? Let's see, I sure did. I bet we did that here too. No, that one's right. All right, and we now have a circuit simulating and we could change the instruction. We can do whatever. I think it's a mugs game to get into trying to simulate on our diagram. Um, we could certainly, you know, do some things like make this a uh, more compact circuit. There's no particular reason to go out of our way to do that. So I'm not going to. We're going to go on and do the HDL. I do want to show you um, one thing before I do that, though. Just to show you how different these things can look, this is the exact same circuit. Well, not the exact same circuit, but an earlier attempt at the CPU that I did a few years ago using Logisim instead of digital. Um, 
<laughs> my concepts of layout were maybe not as sophisticated as they are today. So I'm kind of half using tunnels and half drawing lines all over the place. Uh, it's not great, you know, what can I tell you? So don't feel like there's some, well, there probably is an objectively right answer for what's the minimal circuit that one could do that implements the hack CPU. But if your circuit doesn't look exactly like mine, if you use different logic to arrive at the same result, as long as it passes the tests, that's good enough for purposes of this class. The thing I do want to emphasize is that despite the fact that we spent about, what, seven weeks on hardware, this isn't a hardware class. Most of NAND to Tetris, most of it is spent on the software layers. And in fact, starting next week or the week after, we're gonna start looking at writing the assembler. Eventually, if I stick to it, if it doesn't make for boring YouTube, we may even write a compiler and an operating system. So it's really easy to look at NAND to Tetris and like think that logic gates is the whole thing. It really isn't. So the goal here is to get to something that passes the tests, understand enough of this layer that we have some, some understanding of how the computer is working at the lowest levels. If you got that, you have met the requirements. All of that said, I do still see one problem here. So let's run the circuit as is, and let's set our instruction to something small, which has a most significant bit of zero. So I'm setting this to hex 56. We can see all of our control bits light up. C type is zero, which is correct. We're loading the accumulator, which is correct for an A instruction. Inspecting this wire, we can see our value hex 56 is loading. And we can see that our jump bits are engaged, but this is an A instruction not a C instruction. So the fact that we've got our jump logic doing stuff should concern us because we don't want it to be doing anything when all we want to be doing is loading the A register. And that also suggests, you know, for example, here, this flag is being set. So this A register command is having side effects on the rest of the CPU. And the reason this is happening is because of what I did over here. You might remember when I said, oh, you know, let's just pull a wire off of here. So we need some sort of gate here to prevent all of this activity. We, we, in a case where we're loading the A register, we want all of these flags to be zero. And there's a few different ways to do that. Let's do it with, I believe, a mux. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to get rid of some of these internal tunnels. Just this tunnel right here, this AN. I feel like we can do without, and I feel like that's the, since that's the value that's propagating to the A register, uh, I kind of want it to be very explicitly. That's one that's worth having a wire for. All right. So what are we going to do here? Well, first of all, I think this A input is now garbage and, and let's get rid of it for now. All right, so we want a multiplexer and it needs to be a 16-bit multiplexer. I always forget to do that. And if it's, what, what do we want to select on? We want to select on this C-type wire but my plan is for this breakout to happen after the um, after the box. And we actually need this to even make this decision. So I think that implies that we need another splitter. And in fact, we need a splitter that looks just like this. All right, this is going to be a little bit weird. This is going to be a little bit weird. So we're going to take this 15th bit, which is our C-type bit. We're going to put it right there. We're going to put this here. When C type is one, then we actually do want this entire instruction to go here and to be broken out into its constituent parts, like we've got here. 
So before we enter the mux, we have what used to be called a input. And I think that's still valid, actually. So I'm going to go and recreate, I think, this a input tunnel. A input's actually a really bad name for it. I'm still going to leave it. And what we want going in here for the case where it is a an A instruction, we want it to be a constant. And we want it to be a very specific constant. We want it to be all zeros, I think. And we're going to do this. This is a little... A little silly, but I want to be like 100% sure that we're only using the control bits when, <laughs> okay, that looks ridiculous, that we're only using the control bits when we, um, when we have a C instruction. All right, okay, move this down one just so we can make sure it's connected. All right, let's simulate this. Okay, we're gonna set this to Xerox 56, check a bunch of boxes. We see that that is there. Zero is coming out of here. Let's tick the clock. 56 is coming out of here. That's great. Address 56 says it right there. Let's set it to, um, right. Okay, now we see that our jump logic is working. Take the CPU again. The A register did not change. That's great. All right, I think that this MUX was in fact what we were missing. And now that we have it, I'm much happier. And now, finally, we can actually proceed to the H the to writing the HDL. All right, let's go through and start writing our HDL. So what are we going to need? Well, there's one special requirement here that I do want to call out. It is mentioned in the book. Of course, we're going to need our ALU. Go ahead and put that down there. But you don't want to use your register parts uh, for two reasons. One, they're less efficient than the provided parts, the built-in parts. Second, uh, Neeson and Shaw can provide two special chips called the A register and the D register, which are which behave exactly like the parts that you made, but which um, trigger certain gooey visual side effects in the test program in the hardware simulator so use a register and d register rather than your built-ins and of course we're also going to need a program counter and then we're going to need everything we built so the one thing that is going to make this a lot easier um, is if we find a way to use our names um, from our, our diagram and so one way to do to do that is to go ahead and drop a 16-bit mux for our instruction. We're going to say that the output here is always false in one case, and in the other case, it's an instruction. So what does that buy us? Well, what that buys us is this mux is going to operate on whether this is a C instruction or an A instruction. And so it's going to become important later when we uh, have to deal with our jump bits. We're going to look at the most significant bit of the instruction that comes in. So what does this get us? Well, if it's a C instruction, then we will pass this instruction on. If it's an A instruction, then what we will pass on is all zeros. Why does that matter? Because we're going to do a trick here. We're going to define these bits one at a time. 
etc. Why would we do such a wacky thing? If you'll recall, the very first thing we do here is give all of these lines in the bus names. And so by doing this, we're going to give ourselves the opportunity to name all of these bits in the instructions that we don't have to sit here and uh, type, you know, oh, I want to get to instruction, look it up three. We'd much rather use names for this stuff. So do that. And I do have notes here. Um, obviously, if I'm doing this on uh, a computer after having drawn the diagram, I'm referring back and forth between the diagram. I, it's not interesting for you to watch me switch back over to the diagram. So I'm going to just use my notes. Um, one note here, though, which is that I am going to go back to the diagram for this one. We also do this thing here where we take dest m and we wire it up here. And so we're going to use the HDL syntax, which allows us to send one wire to multiple places to wire up right M right there, which is one of our outputs. Output four is CDSD. Output five is CDSA. Output six is, what did I call it, CNO? Yeah. Might have been better to have called that like C A L U no so that I knew what it was. Why don't we do that? Because you could see that it's going to the A L U on the diagram, but here you're much more likely to lose track of it in the code. So many control bits. Thirteen and fourteen are unused. All right, that gives us a bunch of names that we can work with, which is great. And then we've got our ALU next. I'm just going to do this. And now we're going to move our control bits over, right? And this is where having those names just really helps. Uh, I suppose you're hearing a lot of typing from my keyboard. Uh, I would love to know, is the typing annoying? Is it OK? Uh, I could go to more efforts to try and keep that away from the mic. and keep it out of the video, but I figure, you know, sound effects for when I type, why not? But if, it, if it's annoying, leave a comment in the, uh, leave a comment below and let me know. Hmm. What did I call these? I think I called that 0p. I think I called that negp. Right. And this is another case where we know we also want to route that to memory like so. Okay. So then for our A register, we have a couple of muxes here that we need to create. And again, they have to be 16-bit muxes. The first mux is deciding whether or not we take our instruction. Right? I think that's right. The second one is whether we're taking this as the content, whether we're treating the A register as the A register or as the contents of memory, which is that C, A, or M flag we had before. And that's going to the ALU and that Y, N value, right? I think that's true. And then we have this little construct up here where we're inverting C type. So we're going to need a NOT gate and ORing it with C dest A. 
All right, so let's throw that not gate. That's C type. Yeah, and we need an or where we're oring not C type. Control dust A. And the output of that is this load A flag, which is going to go right here. And then this is going to get the results of that mux that we created a little bit above. Eric out. Is that everything? Oh, we have to do this. So the A register is feeding that address. And you can see we've split out only the top 15 bits of it. So again, we have to do use the bus syntax like so. That's our A register. The D register, thankfully, is much simpler. D register all fits on one line. It just gets the value of the ALU muxed on that flag. And we send its input to there. I think I named these D reg out in the diagram, but that's fine. And we've got our jump logic. This is, again, not hard but it is a little bit annoying. Um, I want to make a virtual predicate over here. Uh, I'm going to invert what I did on the diagram here. We're going to OR these together. I think I used two NOT gates going into an OR gate, but we can do this instead. I don't think uppercase has any particular significance in this HDL language, but will be consistent. All right, so now we have our is greater than kind of a virtual virtual flag. So we need three ands. Yep. And those are based on jump if equal. Right. Jump of less than. And jump if greater than. And then we have to OR these together. We used a three bit OR, <laughs> three bit, a three way OR gate. In our diagram, we don't have a three-way OR gate here, so we're just going to do it like so. And look, already I'm lying about using only lowercase. Oh well. And that becomes, yes, we're jumping. Uh, and to jump means to load the program counter. What are we loading it with? We're loading it with the output of the, a, the contents of the A register. We're always going to increment. Um, if load is set to true, then the increment will be ignored. Reset is hooked up to the reset switch. And this is a 15-bit output, not a 16-bit output. So we have to do that, I think. Let's do that just to be sure. That, well, I'm sure we're missing something, but let's go to the hardware simulator and see how bad we did. Let's make that nice and big. 
<laughs> I wish this thing laid out. It wastes all this space. Java is so terrible. All right, so we need cpu.htl. Hey, it loaded. There you can see our ALU. What can I do? Screen output, comparison, screen. All right, we'll do that. And then let's load our script. Moment of truth. You can see it was doing a bunch of jumps there. Comparison ended successfully. We've created a CPU. Congratulations. If you've made it this far, you've really accomplished something. For the coup de gras of our project, we're going to build the computer. And after building the CPU, building the computer might be a little bit of a letdown. It is literally three parts. We did all of the hard part in memory mapping in the memory module and in writing the CPU. So we've got three parts. One part is the CPU we just built. Put that there for now. We've got the memory chip that we just built. And we've got this provided chip, which is where the program memory is. And we're going to come and look at that later when we actually start writing our programs, because this is where the programs we write are going to go. So we'll just call that ROM out for now. The address is going to be the output of the program counter or the output of the CPU, really. But All right, so what do we need? Our memory has these four. inputs and CPU has you might recall we literally just made it it's got some inputs and outputs Call that PC out because we already gave that a name. So what I find helpful here is actually to think of the memory module as being kind of our dispatch, right? So if it's going into the memory module, you're storing it, right? If the right flag is set, you're writing it. We'll do that. Uh, one thing that always confused the heck out of me when I was younger is this load store terminology. It, it's, it was exactly the opposite of what I expected as a human, as a young human. I wanted store to mean something different. Right? Store means you're going from the CPU to the memory. Load means you're going from the memory to the CPU. Whereas, I don't know, I, I always think I'm thinking as if I'm the CPU. So it's kind of backwards from what I expect. It's just a term of art and you gotta get used to it. Okay, so in memory, over in M over here, is wired up that way. The instruction is coming from our ROM, which we already created. The reset button is just given to us as, a, as an input. So like so, if it's going out to memory, then you're going there. If then the right flag just goes gets passed straight through, as does the address flag. Literally, this is just connecting the inputs and outputs and you're done. I think this is it. Uh, I don't think there's anything more complicated than this in the CPU. Let's take a look. Or then the, in the uh, computer. Okay, load computer.htl. 
no syntax errors, that's great. And we have a bunch of programs here. So let's look at add.tst. This is just simply adding two values. That one worked. We can load the rest of the scripts here. Do max. That worked. Select the screen option. I did choose the screen option. Oh, animate. No. There we go. I did not choose the screen option. You could see it's drawing a rectangle. <laughs> Let's do it one more time. Ready? There we go. Super fast computer here. We drew a rectangle. We've successfully built a computer in simulation. Would this work if you actually built it in hardware? Yes, yes it would. How would it perform in that situation? How expensive would it be? How much of a pain would it be to wire this stuff up? Probably a lot. Uh, it's why people teach this class in simulation. That concludes the hardware portion of our NAND to Tetris course. If all you are here for is the hardware, via con Dios, it was good teaching you or good showing you how I did this. If you are interested in assembly language programming and going on to the next part of our class, the next task is going to be to write an assembler. I don't know how long it's going to take me to spin up on that. I'm tentatively intending on using the Haskell programming language to do so, but I do hope you will join us for it. This has been Programming Like It's 1979. Thanks for watching.